All right, and that was the press briefing with the, uh, Mr. Patrick Abwaji from the Ghana Health Service updating us on the figures. At this point, uh, we have increased our numbers uh, by 229 cases. And so we've moved from 11,954 currently to 12,193, with our active cases also increasing uh, to 7,813. We'll break down the figures for you, but this is COVID-19 360. We're back. And we'll be looking at the various angles. Uh, I mean, basically speaking, uh, hopefully, to someone from the embassy, the Ghana embassy in New York, to give us more details after uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Madam Shirley Ayoko Butre, also updated us on plans to evacuate more Ghanaians stranded abroad. And so all that and more coming your way on today's show. My name is Berla Mundia. My partner is here with me. Yes, my name is Anita Ekia Kufu. And on the global front, yesterday we went past the 8 million mark. And so globally, the number of confirmed cases is above 8 million. And as of yesterday during COVID-19, 360, we were around the 7.8 million mark, meaning that over 200,000 cases have been recorded globally. And that has increased the figure as well. But you out there, have you resumed school? Uh, I mean, the various tertiary institutions, what is happening in your various campuses? We want to find out from you right here on COVID-19, 360, what isn't going right for you? And what do you think can be done even better? And so our social media pages, Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, everywhere is active. Our WhatsApp number will be scrolling on the screens very soon as well. And then you get to send in your messages. We will be reading everything right here for you, Bella. Absolutely. So we came across a statement, and this was concerning the evacuation of stranded Ghanaians um, in New York. And so um, this was signed by, it was issued on Monday, June 15th, which was yesterday by the Consul General of New York, where it indicated the cost of traveling for people who are stranded. And so I'll just try and read a bit of it and also link it to Madame Shelley Ayoko Boche's update this morning. So it says that uh, the permanent mission of Ghana to the United Nations and the Consulate General of New York presents their compliments and informs stranded Ghanaians who are registered with the Consulate General to note and observe the following. So one, it says the flights from New York will be on June 25th, 2020 uh, from Liberty International Airport, Newark, New Jersey. And then the reporting time is 1 p.m. Departure is 5.25 p.m. The airfare for the flight is $1,350 U.S. dollars for economy class and $2,840 U.S. dollars for business class plus two pieces of luggage. Um, and they gave the details for that as well. And it says fares for infants can be found at the Ethiopian Airlines website. So there'll be pre-boarding, screening, blah, blah, blah. All those day, uh, details are there. And it says there'll be a 14-day mandatory quarantine upon arrival in Accra with the possibility of extension to 21 days. Depends on your situation. But the cost of quarantine will be borne by the evacuee as per the attached selected hotel. So we have two hotels here. There's Kempinski Hotel. There's Africa Regent Hotel. Kempinski is charging 650 Ghana cities per night. And Africa regions, 550 Ghana cities per night. And all this will be borne by the people who are coming in. So they're paying for their flights and they're also paying um, for accommodation during mandatory quarantine. And this question was posed to the foreign affairs minister. And she outlined the challenges that, you know, the government, of course, is facing. And that's why they are asking for other people to pay. Because first of all, they're even finding it difficult uh, to get hotels to come on board because of fear of stigmatization. And so they are the only two hotels that so far they have been able to confirm. And the cost is so high, um, so then it makes it difficult for also government to be the one to bear the cost. And she says that for smaller hotels, it's impossible to put um, you know, um, citizens there because there's also a limitation as to how many security personnel there can be at one place. So then it means that they'll have to you know, share them across the various hotels. Whereas if they get one big hotel that can take a number of people, maybe 100 people per, um, you know, at a time, then it also reduces the cost of having to put security officials there and also the testing officials uh, who go there and collect their samples and all of that. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but of course she's being very candid about the situation, I believe. Well, we appreciate um, her, her honesty as well. Yeah. But I think the prices are outrageous. I mean... Well, but that's what she's saying, that unfortunately the other hotels are not willing to offer their services. And so these are the only two hotels, according to the minister. And so that's what makes it difficult to find cheaper hotels. Hmm. Um, yeah. 
I, <laughs> I don't know what you think, but yesterday we spoke to a stranded Ghanaian in the Netherlands, Reverend Bannerman, and he was complaining bitterly about, you know, why they should be the one to bear the cost for mandatory quarantine because he says a lot of money has been raised for COVID-19 in Ghana. We've borrowed money from, you know, uh, you know, the World Bank and all of that. And so why are we not able to foot the bill, at least if they're willing to pay for the At tickets? least, just a little bit of it hmm. should be taken care of. At least, if, you know, the people as well are willing to pay the other parts, then they come yeah. to a consensus. But uh, allowing them to foot the entire bill, you know, we have some people who went there for business and already they are, you know, cash, you know, yeah. struck yeah, a little bit. And loss, so exactly. coming down here and then being, you know, mandatorily quarantined for a while and then having to pay this amount of money for 14 days. Hmm. That's a whole lot. That is. That is indeed. Uh, and well, we're looking to see if there'll be any change. But she also mentioned that so far, 856 Ghanaians have been assisted to come back home. As it stands now, we're expecting a number of Ghanaians, about 250 of them from uh, United Arab Emirates. We have 13 from Burkina Faso who will be coming by road. Another 195 from Lebanon. Uh, that's going to be on the 19th of this month. And also there are plans to evacuate Ghanaians from New York, um, Washington, D.C. by the end of the month and also from China and other um, African countries as well. So there is a plan and government is committed to bringing back these stranded citizens. So no cost to worry except that you have to pay the cost. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, let's quickly take a look at our news update. And then when we come back, Anita will break it down for us in terms of the figures that have been presented by the Ghana Health Service. Welcome to news update on COVID-19 360. Botswana remains one of Africa's least impacted countries, one of a handful with less than 100 cases of COVID-19. Government has in the past months taken drastic measures, including a strict lockdown. President Eric Masisi tested negative for the third time on June 1. The host parliament was quarantined at a point when a health worker tested positive there. As part of containment measures, wearing of homemade masks have been made obligatory in public. Data collection has also been a key plank of the response as part of contact tracing efforts. Schools are also set to reopen, along with a trend across parts of Africa. Strict health protocols are also to be observed as kids return for lessons. U.S. regulators on Monday revoked emergency authorization for malaria drugs promoted by President Donald Trump for treating COVID-19 amid growing evidence that they don't work and could cause serious side effects. The Food and Drug Administration said the drugs, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, are unlikely to be effective in treating the coronavirus. Citing reports of heart complications, the FDA said the drugs' unapproven benefit do not outweigh the known and potential risk. The decades-old drugs, also prescribed for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, can cause heart rhythm problems, severely low blood pressure and muscle or nerve damage. Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, became the third African country to record over 10,000 cases of COVID-19. The milestone was reached on May 31 when 307 new cases took its tally to 10,162. As Africa's biggest economy, the federal government has continued to enforce regulations across the board, even though most state governments have moved to relax restrictions. Lagos, being the economic nerve center, is rolling out a progressive reopening of the economy. It is the most impacted state with over 5,000 cases as of May 31. Cross River State is yet to record a case. The national response is led by the presidential tax force, led by CGF boss Mustafa, along with the national coordinator and, re and relative ministers, chief among them, health, foreign affairs and education ministries. The Kenyan authorities are investigating the disappearance of medical equipment donated to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The personal protective equipment from the Chinese government included surgical masks, protective suits, isolation gowns and thermometers worth $2 million. An investigation by local TV station KTN News revealed how a private company working with government officials and Chinese businessmen in Kenya laid claim to the donation when it arrived in the country. During the bizarre incident, the company went on to donate part of the stolen supplies to other Kenyan government ministries. Kenya has received millions of dollars from countries and organizations around the world to help in the fight against coronavirus. Tanzania's Prime Minister Kasim Majilwa has said there are 66 active coronavirus cases in the country, 
the latest data by the government on the pandemic since its top giving updates on 29 April. Mr. Majaliwa said the 66 patients were hospitalized in 10 regions and that the rest of the 16 regions did not have an active case. President John Magafuli had days ago declared the country coronavirus-free thanks to prayers by citizens. The U.S. Embassy last month warned the hospitals in Dar es Salaam were overwhelmed and that the chances of contracting the virus was extremely high but did not give evidence to back up its claims. The Prime Minister in his briefing on Monday said the number of infections in the country had reduced. He urged Tanzanians to keep following the safety guidelines issued to prevent the spread of the virus. And that's it for news update right here on COVID-19 360. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19, 360, and that was the news update. But uh, looking at the Ghana Health Service dashboard, unfortunately, it uh, looks like they're trying to update the new figures. And so their uh, website is a little bit down from the screen. But I'll be giving you the breakdown of the figures. And as of this morning, as mentioned by Dr. Patrick Kumar Bwaje, at the press briefing at the Ministry of Information, we've added 229 new um, cases and also 68 new recoveries. So our tally has moved from 11,963. And yesterday we mentioned that we were 36 cases away from the 12,000 mark. But this morning we've gone past the 12,000 mark with 12,193 cases. Uh, that is positive confirmed coronavirus cases and recoveries at 4,326. That is an additional of 68 new recoveries. And so active cases now stands at 7,813. And these are people that are being managed in treatment sites, isolation centers, and under home management as well. Now, when we come to the deaths, we have 58 deaths. That is four new. We've moved from 54 to 58. And uh, the, the deaths, we are told that we have three males and then one female. And then the age range is from 48 to 79 years. And so that is the average you know, age range we are looking at. And 13 cases are severe, four cases are critical, and three on ventilators. And the new 229 uh, cases we've recorded are from nine out of the 16 regions, with the Ashanti region giving us the highest, which is 70 new cases and so when the website is updated i'm sure when you visit it you you can find all the figures and all the updates and also for routine surveillance enhanced contact tracing and also mandatory quarantine as well and so as said now this is how the ghana health service dashboard is looking like but most of the time we have all the parameters available and so definitely i'm sure they are trying to update the figures and so that is why we're having issues with it Absolutely. Now, they also mentioned yesterday, and I'm talking about the information minister, that there's, there's a new parameter um, as to how to view the figures on the Ghana Health Service website. So now they're going to be including daily, uh, you know, case count. Uh, when you check, well, before they started updating, they only had case count. And so you'd realize that one journalist was asking if they actually mean daily case count or case count. And so I think they are going to rectify that and so we'll be waiting for it but just to add on to anita so the nine um you know regions that have recorded of course the shanti region has recorded 70 new cases central region with 42 new cases savannah region with 34 new cases greater Accra with 32 western region uh with 17 and uh, eastern region with 11 northern region with 11 and um upper west with 10 and so that means that the other regions that have not been mentioned did not record any. By the way, OT also recorded two. So these are the nine regions that have recorded cases. We'll be speaking to a rep from uh, the Consular General of New York, I believe, the Ghana Embassy. And we'll be asking them a few questions. Madame Shelly ayoko Butre also mentioned that as much as we're complaining about the cost of hotel accommodation for mandatory quarantine, they are looking for a way to give these stranded Ghanaians some respite in terms of um, hotel bills. So let's see what happens with that. But now we'll take a look at Africa's case count. So on the African continent, more cases have been recorded. And every time I open this particular dashboard, I'm amazed looking at how over the past couple of weeks we've been able to, you know, rack up when it comes to the figures. But 
As of this morning, the number of confirmed cases on the African continent is 252,382, with 5,539 healthcare workers being affected and deaths standing at 6,795. And out of this 252,382 confirmed cases, we've recorded 114,808 of them have recovered and south africa is contributing a whooping 73,533. and yesterday i made mention of the fact that some police officers uh, you know who are part of the south african police force have been affected that is over 1400 of them had been affected and this morning from an update 98 teachers and 1800 students have been affected by the novel coronavirus in south africa and schools reopened in south africa earlier this month and from what the health minister is saying these students and teachers got the virus when the country was under lockdown and so it's not necessarily because they are back to school that is why they have the virus but we're, we're hoping maybe it stays that way but as it stands now some teachers and also over 1500 students in south africa have been affected by the novel coronavirus and when we move to egypt uh, one of the second highest on the African continent with 46,289. And in Egypt as well, some of their prisons are recording uh, prisoners, you know, uh, being infected by the novel coronavirus and some deaths as well. And that is one of the main issues that have popped up, especially in Egypt, looking at, uh, you know, their, their prison situation and how the novel coronavirus is affecting prisoners or detainees as well. And when we go to Nigeria, which is now the third highest uh, country on the African continent with 16,658 confirmed cases. And Nigeria, their, their health system is uh, quite overwhelmed looking at the cases they are recording. And as of yesterday, a cross-section of some nurses and doctors uh, have decided to lay down their tools saying that if they are not being paid and also not being treated well, that's why the number of cases that are being recorded, especially around this time, they, they think they, they are laying down their tools and if government doesn't come in, then it means that things will get really terrible, you know, in some parts of Nigeria. Now, when we come down to Ghana here, uh, I guess this website is also here to update the figure now. It has moved to 12,193. That is from 11,964 confirmed cases down here in Ghana to over 12,193. Now, let's go to Algeria, which is the fifth on the African continent with 11,031 cases. Now, Algeria has uh, some 58 provinces and out of that, there was a curfew and out of that 58 provinces, 19 of them, the curfew is being lifted. And so things are gradually easing and things are going back to normal in some provinces in Algeria. And then they are looking forward to easing more on the restrictions as well. And then finally, let's look at Cameroon with 10,140. And so these are some of the countries in the, you know, over 10,000 mark. We're talking about South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Algeria, Cameroon, Morocco. Uh, no, so Morocco and Sudan now fall under the 10,000 mark. And then with Senegal, Guinea, DRC and the rest coming in. Now let's look at recoveries, which is quite impressive. Looking at uh, how we started with our recoveries and also with our case counts as well. But for the recoveries, we are at 114,808 recoveries. That is what has to do with the recoveries. And so South Africa is leading as well with recoveries. And for the Western Cape and then Eastern Cape, they are contributing the highest when it comes to recoveries in South Africa. And South Africa, out of over 70,000 cases, 39,867 of it are recoveries and Egypt has 12,329, Morocco with 7,880, Algeria 7,735, Cameroon with 5,601, and Nigeria impressively with 5,349. And finally, we come to Ghana with 4,258. And also for healthcare workers, we have South Africa leading with 2,084 healthcare workers being affected. So out of the 5,539 healthcare workers who have been affected on the African continent, South Africa is contributing 2,084 with 14 deaths when it, it comes to healthcare workers. And then in Nigeria, we have 812. And so that is it. 
Uh, Bella is standing by with yeah. a conversation. And Absolutely. The show continues. Now, we'll be speaking to the head of information um, permanent mission to Ghana uh, at the United Nations and Ghana Consulate General in New York. He's Frederick Kofi Amea. Good morning, Frederick. Well, and so that is it. Uh, Frederick, can you hear us? Absolutely. Frederick, good morning. We'll be speaking to the head of information, uh, permanent mission to Ghana. Okay. Uh, at the United Nations. I think it's a little delayed from where he is, um, but I hope you can hear us, Frederick. Good morning. Hello, Frederick. Okay. Uh, a bit of a challenge. We'll get back to him on this. But we'll be speaking to him about uh, the information that says that some stranded Ghanaians may have to pay for their flights and also Good for morning. accommodation. Good morning. I, I can okay. hear you and I can see you. You can hear me or you can't? Okay. We'll take a break and try and fix this problem. We'll be right back. So today, the 16th of June 2020, will be exactly two days since final year students started reporting to their various institutions. And yesterday, we brought you some updates on that in terms of how prepared the institutions are in receiving the students as well. And of course, a bit of discussion on e-learning will be taking place today because some institutions decided to still go ahead with their e-learning, while some others decided to combine e-learning with having some students also come back to campus to complete the six-week um, you know, course and also write exams for four weeks before they finish off um, the year. So today we'll be zooming in on one of these institutions, and that is Valley View University. And uh, we have in the studios Dr. Winfred Ofoy Lakote. Lakote? <laughs> Lakote. Lakote, yes. Thank you so much for correcting me. And he is the Director for Information Technology Services and also at the Valley View University. Good morning and welcome. Mm -hmm. And we have Michael Tete Asari. He is the Team Leader, Educational and Instructional Technology Support Unit, Valley View University. Both of you are welcome. Thank and you. first of all, before I come to you, Doc, let me ask Michael, have we had students resuming to campus yet? Uh, yes, in our case, um, because we've already written exams, mm. there is no need for the students to come. Okay. Yes. Um, so every final year student has completed? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Well, With their final exams, I mean. Um, for the sandwich mode, they mm. are not writing the exam, but with the regular mode, examination All is already. Were there um, no challenges taking... with internet connectivity that would afford some students the opportunity to come back to school? Yes. Um, for internet connectivity, um, it's something that we cannot run away from. Mm. You know, even in Accra, there are certain places that um, internet connectivity is that bad. Mm -hmm. So examination questions are set in such, such a way that um, the student will have ample time to work and then submit when it's done. We are looking at um, take-home exams or open-ended um, questions. Okay, you've given them some take-home exams. Yes. How long is that going to take before they um, you know, send it back? Yeah, so it depends on the kind of uh, examination, okay. the question that was set. So it can take between um, 12 hours to 48 hours. Oh, I see. Yeah. 12 to 48 hours. And there haven't been complaints? Well, definitely some students will complain. But, okay. Um, so that's what I'm asking. So for such students who are complaining about internet connectivity, because not everybody um, you know, will be able to answer the questions as quickly. And it won't be any fault of theirs, but also because of where they live and whether they, are, they have active internet. What happens to them? Is there any plan to have them back in school? Yeah, for what the university has decided is that sometime in July, yeah. we're going to have some make-up take make, uh, make exams again. Okay. So students who couldn't um, write the papers due to connectivity issues would have the chance. They would to have write, the yeah. chance. Okay, that's fine. But let's talk about e-learning then, because I know that that was also a very vital part of you know, the lockdown period up until now. And so, Doc, what has been the uniqueness of Valley View's e-learning process? Okay, thank you. Um, probably you must know that Valley View started its e-learning a long time ago. Okay. Way back sometime in, um, in 2016, we were doing it for the distance mode. Okay. We've been doing it and, and all those things. Now, as part of the current vis uh, Vice Chancellor's vision, Professor Kwame, Daniel Kwame Bediakon, he decided to also make it um, much more elaborate so that all students, at least each student, can have a, an, an online program. Mm -hmm. So we had already put in measures with the administration's back, back end. What happened was um, the provider chancellor set up a team and then we had to work um, 
quickly to make sure that the students, we can have some, um, we can expand our programs to cover all the, the campuses and the modes of learning. Okay. So that's what we did. And to make it easier for the students, we made sure each student had data. So, you know, students are not living in the same places. So some yeah. network issues could happen. So we made them decide on which uh, network they wanted. So we had three networks. Okay. But what we also did was to zero rate our websites, our e-learning sites, uh. to make sure that students don't pay or they don't, they don't spend much when they go on, on to their Okay, uh, no, let's, let's agree. Are they paying for it at a very low cost or they are not paying at all? No, they are not, they are not paying at, at all. It's zero rated. So the invest okay. is bearing that cost. I see. The telcos, yeah. Mm. Oh, and this has been happening since for the past schools three were shut now. down? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And what we also did was to make sure that we activate our mobile platforms. It's already there, but we expanded them. So students could pay their school fees through mobile phone, mobile numbers. Uh, they could also request for their transcripts, certificates, and all mm -hmm. this. So the university virtually went online. Okay, yes. literally. Yes. And, and I know that in the future, this is also going to be a key part because you, like you said, were already doing this in the past. Yeah. Um, going forward, I'm sure the administration has plans to make sure that we have that kind of a hybrid program. Okay. What, what's going to happen is that learning is going to change. Mm. Yeah, so Valley View is ready for, for this kind of change. But I'm sure that there are various opportunities that these institutions can identify uh, based on this pandemic. Have you identified any of them and how are you assessing and taking advantage of that? Okay. Okay. What we have realized is that um, whenever we are pushed to the wall, we right. try to do what we normally wouldn't be able to do. Okay. And so our students love the e-learning. In fact, they've had initially there were some because it was there. We ex we had expanded and all those things. Yeah. But once we we calm the fears and all those things, they fall in love with it. And so when we even asked the fourth years if they would like to come back since the president, they said no. They want to continue. All of them said no. Yeah, the sandwich students at least to finish their exam online. Okay. So that's the beauty of it. Now, students are even thinking of having their manifesto reading online mm. for the SRC elections. Okay. And also voting online sometime in July. And all these things are happening because, um, of course, probably those are the benefits of COVID-19. Definitely. And um, I, I'm actually looking forward to how this is going to play out, especially for Valley View University. But even aside that, what other things are we going to start implementing once there's op an opportunity for us all to go back to school? Michael? All right, so um, we are looking at running some of our programs or courses online mm. fully. Okay, because um, this. I want you 19, to project a bit if you don't mind. Okay, yes. this, this COVID 19, um, we are looking at it from the positive side. Uh, we realize that most students are enjoying the fact that they can study from the comfort of their homes. Mm. So, what if some programs can be run fully online? Does it not make them lazy? No, that's a it's form very of flexible involving. learning. It's very involving. Yeah. So um, the beauty of it is studying the comfort of your homes. Okay. So you don't need to worry about um, your environment. All you need to do is um, get the resources, study. And, and just move on with your life. Exactly. Okay. Well, Doc, you want to say something before I wrap up on this? No, I was just talking about the, the students love the flexible way of learning. Okay. That's what we've, we've grown to realize. Mm. Is the, you can learn at your leisure. You can... When it's time, you can go there. There's someone, there are some instructions you have to follow, and then you can submit an assignment at your leisure and all those things. Mm. And so we realize that students really enjoy that. Yeah. That, and and I'm, I'm sure the investors would like to continue. And it's an opportunity for us to also become more technology savvy because that's also been a problem uh, for a lot of people across the country. So I, I'm sure that that's one of the opportunities that you may have identified, especially for your students. Yes, initially, they, some of them who were not technology savvy had issues. But we had to take our time to train them, mm. to explain things to them, to psych them up. We even had our, our psychologists record some videos just for the students to prepare for their e-learning programs. I see. Yeah, so it calmed their, their nerves and they were able to follow through. Okay. And the team was always ready, preparing for, for eventualities to, mm -hmm. to resolve. So we have a very good vice chancellor, Professor Daniel Kwame Bediako, and, a, and an active pro vice chancellor who are all very much interested in technology and how... So it helped us. Management were solidly behind us. Yeah. And I don't think the results are out yet. I don't think you've even started marking. I was going to compare results from e-learning as against, you know, being on campus physically and writing exams, whether there has been any improvement in the e-learning. I'm sure Michael would like to speak to that. Um, but, yeah. is, is it a too early a call? Yes. It's okay. too early to, to, yeah. to say that. Okay. 
Okay, then we'll just wait and, and probably find yeah, out more details about, about that. Talking about the challenges in terms of usage and all that, you mm. know, um, with Value Investee, since, let me say, 2015 or 2016, what we do is that at the beginning of every semester, we take our faculty through how to teach online. Okay. So we didn't start this um, just after the COVID-19 um, yeah. pandemic. You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Anyway, well, I wish you both the best, and of course, the institution in general. I wish you the very best. Uh, I've been Thank speaking you. to Michael um, and Dr. Let me just get the names right. Michael Tetiasari is Team Leader, Educational and Instructional Technology Support Unit. And also Dr. Winfred Ofoy Lakote. He is the Director of Information Technology Services Directorate, both from the Valley View University. We will be speaking to Frederick Kofi Ameya, who is the Head of Information Permanent Mission of Ghana to the United Nations shortly. It's COVID-19 360. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. On the screen behind me is Frederick Kofi Ameya, Head of Information Permanent Mission of Ghana to the United Nations and Ghana Consulate General in New York. Good morning, Fred. G good morning, Bella. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And this is in relation to um, a letter uh, that was put out titled Evacuation of Stranded Ghanaians. And it's talking about helping, um, you know, Ghanaians stranded in New York to be evacuated back to Ghana. Are you aware of this? Bella, can you kindly speak up? Uh, I can hardly hear you. Okay. So can you hear me? Is it better now? Yeah, it's better. So what I'm saying is I have come across a letter uh, from the Consul General in New York. And it was uh -huh. issued on Monday. And the title says Evacuation of Stranded Ghanaians. So basically trying to evacuate Ghanaians stranded in New York back to Ghana. Are you aware of this letter? As a matter of fact, um, let me say a very good morning to you and to your um, crew for doing such a wonderful job. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm very much aware of that because I issued that statement. Okay. Indeed, okay. Um, since May 8th um, this year, um, the government through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integrations um, told the uh, missions abroad to compile an, um, a list of Ghanaians who are stranded in the various um, um, countries. So we did exactly that. Um, because the missions were closed, we had to issue a letter to the general public for people to um, go on to a link that we created for them to register. Since then, we've been having some Ghanaians who are genuinely stranded and um, government was able to categorize these people into those who have come as a result of um, government-related activities here okay. in the United States. Some were here um, as sponsored students to study mm. here. And some were also people who have come for one reason, for a social or even economic reason, and they had to return home. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the borders were, were closed, so they couldn't come back. And they are stranded, they run out of their resources, okay. and they need to come back home. So the ministry gave the green light for us to evacuate them. And to that effect, I issued a statement alerting the general public that that evacuation will be happening on June 25th. Okay. All right. If that's the case, you mentioned a list that was compiled earlier. Does it mean that anyone who did not heed to the earlier call may not necessarily be part of um, you know, this evacuation, even if they come later with their money? What we have done is to um, issue details of the evacuation um, regarding uh, mode of payment, amount to be paid, um, the quarantine um, um, facilities that will be used, and the time for the flight reporting, and all these information. We've sent it to everybody who registered with us. It's our belief that everybody will be evacuated. However, maybe for one reason or the other, some people might not be part of it. So for now, we've just issued these details to the people who have registered. Okay. We are hoping we've given a deadline of um, um, by Friday, we should have um, everybody submitting their payments um, okay. regarding, again, the hotel, uh, as in the quarantine um, facility, and the um, air ticket, airline ticket. So by then, we'll be able to know how many people are indeed coming back home? That means if you're not able to pay both the tickets plus your uh, mandatory quarantine fees, you will not be allowed to board the flight, right? 
Unfortunately, that is the case because the 14 day mand mandatory quarantine is something that I think we cannot overlook uh, because of import spreading. Um, as much as we want everybody to ba be back home, we are also mindful of the fact that you know we, we need to take the uh, precautionary measures to ensure that people who might be you know positive for the virus do not come into the Ghanaian community and spread it. And uh, you know, um, our first two cases in um, sometime in March 11th or 12th were all imported cases, and now we are talking about almost 12,000 cases. So, okay. um, government is very mindful of that. Um, so, if um, you don't pay for the quarantine, unfortunately, because without a quarantine, uh, it will be very hard for government to you know track you, provide the necessary logistics for mm -hmm. your testing, to monitor you, and ensure that everybody is okay. Um, okay. Um, so again, um, we are we are very sorry that without a quarantine, without you making payment for the quarantine, you cannot be able to join the flight back home. Are there any exceptions? There Will any there be exceptions? interventions for stranded students? Maybe. Um, I, unfortunately, as it stands now, there are no exceptions. And in fact, um, um, I heard the minister, in fact, I watched the minister going to the Ministry of Foreign um, mm. you know, Information for the Meet the Press um, um, thing. Yeah. And she made it clear that at this point, what we are negotiating for is a reduced uh, rate for the quarantine fee, mm -hmm. the hotels, because uh, people are rancorously um, 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 agitating uh, that the, the cost of the quarantine is a bit too high. So government should be able to do something. Um, okay. In as much as I, I seek the welfare and I represent the well-being and the welfare of the people here in the tri-state of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut, I can also appreciate the position of government. Unfortunately, um, hotels are not uh, accepting evacuees. Mm. So it beca it's becoming a bit difficult. Those who are accepting the hotels that are accepting evacuees are charging this rate. And if you look at a place like Kimpiski, charging you know, an average of $120, including breakfast, lunch, and um, dinner, mm. it's quite okay, under it's normal, okay. You know, on a regular day. But because people are already stranded, they've, they've exhausted their resources and all of that. So it becomes a bit... Uh, you know, a bit difficult and a bit challenging. I've had people calling me, telling me they can't come again when they saw the details yeah. of the of the of the modalities. The, the prices the are quite steep. I won't lie. The prices are a, a bit high, and so I'm sure that not everybody may be able to afford it. But quickly, my final question before the prices are the prices are a bit on the high. But exactly, um, um, I, I'm, yeah. But anyway, any reason why Ethiopian Airlines is the flight that's bringing them back home? And why are we not providing uh, these people with PPEs? Because the letter stated that they also have to provide their own PPEs. Yes. Um, so we spoke with the airline yesterday, and um, they are saying that um, they, don't, they do not, according to their protocol, they do not provide um, PPEs. And, we asked them what, what sort of PPEs will be required, and they made us aware that it will only be the face mask. That's what um, we will only be um, required to, yeah. to, to have on us when we bought. But what about the, the government of Ghana? Yes. Shouldn't they be able to provide if the airline is not providing? Can you repeat that for me, please? I'm saying that if the airline is not able to provide, what about the country, government? Shouldn't we be able to provide, especially looking at how much they're paying? Um, you know, for their tickets plus quarantine. Well, th these are some of the uh, the discussions that are ongoing. Um, yesterday, when we had a meeting at the mission, um, we 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 are going to consult a, a medical team here in New York uh, to go with us to do the um, pre-boarding screening. And as part of suggestions that are coming on board, if um, the mission would have to provide for the face mask, we would do so. But in the okay. meantime, um, as it stands now, um, the evacuees are supposed to provide their own PPEs. And when it becomes necessary that we have to uh, support, um, you know, or some sort of extenuating or some mitigating uh, measures so that it will cushion them, we will come in and help them. Like I said, today, earlier today, I heard 
uh, the foreign minister yeah. making the point that they are calling on other hotels who will to be also able come to accommodate board. these evacuees uh, so that uh, the cost will be reduced. So government is open for suggestions. We are open for uh, other measures that will be able to reduce the burden on okay. these uh, already stranded Ghanaians who find themselves here. Quick one. Do we already have people who have paid for their flights and mandatory? Uh, and how many, many are those? Well, if in we fact, may... some people um, contacted me to make payments on their behalf. So, yeah, we have people who have shown interest. Hmm, and like I, I said, by Friday, we can have a full appreciation of how many people have registered okay. um, thus far. All so, right. uh, for the pur for purposes of information, um, we, there, will, there will be two points of evacuation. One will be the Liberty International Airport, Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That will be the 25th, next week, Thursday. And then there will be another one on 28th from IAD, that is um, Dallas International Airport in Washington, in Washington. D.C. Okay. So what that means is that people, Ghanaians stranded in the east coast of the United States of America will join that in Newark. All and right. then those in the, right. west in the west coast will join we'll that join in Washington, D.C. All right. Thank you so much, so Frederick. So if you find yourself, say, in Chicago or Ohio or Missouri, uh, you must... You know, uh, as there much as it might be uncomfortable and okay. unfortunate, you must come to Washington D.C. You know, you no problem. Big. We cannot evacuate people from where Ghanaians are. All right, anywhere. thank you so much, Frederick Kofia Mayao, head of information permanent mission of Ghana to the United Nations and Ghana Consulate General in New York. Thank you for speaking to us, and we've gone beyond our time. But thank you so much for staying with us. This has been COVID-19 360. My name is Brella Mundi. I've been doing this with Anita Ekuya Ekufu, and we'll be back same time tomorrow, 10 to 11.30 a.m.